Welcome back to the Eldritch Hearth. It's True Crime Tuesday, and today we're going to be covering the murder of Mary Fagan and the lynching of Leo Frank. Trigger warning for murder, racism, anti-Semitism, and lynching. Leo Frank was born in April 1884 in Cuero, Texas, but the family soon moved to New Brooklyn, New York, where he went to school. He graduated from Cornell and then moved to Atlanta, where he became the superintendent of the National Pencil Company. Leo was well respected within the Jewish community in Atlanta. He married in 1910 and considered his life to be very happy, and he was the president of the Benai Brith. Mary Fagan was a 12-year-old worker at the factory. She had been born to tenant farmers and her father died soon afterwards, so the family moved from place to place before finally settling in Atlanta. At the age of 10, she had begun to work part-time in a textile factory. But now at 12, she was working 55 hours a week for 10 cents an hour at the National Pencil Company. She worked on the knurling machine, which inserted the rubber erasers into the wooden pencils. Mary was known as a pretty and cheerful girl who always followed her mother's rules. On April 21st, 1913, Mary was laid off because there was a shortage of materials. On April 26th, 1913, she went into the office to pick up her paycheck. She did not return home that night and her mother was terrified. Around 3 a.m. the next morning, April 27th, the night watchman at the National Pencil Company, a black man named Newt Lee, went into the basement to use the restroom. While he was down there, he found the battered body of Mary Fagan far to the back of the basement near the incinerator. A strip of her petticoat had been tied around her face and her face and hands were blackened and beaten and the poor 12 year old girl had been strangled to death with a wrapping cord. Lee called the police who came in to investigate the crime scene. They trampled through footprints and walked through a path which appeared to have the drag marks where Mary had been dragged. A sliding door leading to the basement had, was discovered to have been tampered with so that it could not lock and a bloody fingerprint was found on the lock. Two notes written on invoices from the factory were at her head. They said, he said he would love me land down play like the night witch did it but that long tall negro did boy his self the second note said ma'am that negro higher down here did this i went to make water he pushed me down that hole a long tall negro black that who it was long slim tall negro i write while play with me the night witch in the letters appeared to refer to the night watch Newt Lee. Lee and a friend of his were immediately arrested. However, as the police continued to investigate the factory, they found a hair on a lathe and what appeared to be bloodstains on the second floor, near the office of Leo Frank, the superintendent. Both Newt Lee and the police had been unable to reach Leo Frank the night before when the body was first discovered. However, at 7 a.m., the police finally did reach him and he arrived at the factory. According to them, he appeared extremely nervous, pale, trembling, and rubbing his hands together. When they asked him if he knew who Mary Fagan was, he said that he wasn't sure, but he would check the payroll books. He gave a full statement to the police later in the day, giving his complete timeline of April 26th, stating that he was in the office around noon to hand out pay. Around 4 p.m. that day, Newt Lee had arrived for his shift. However, Leo Frank told him that he was not done working yet and to come back at 6 p.m. According to Lee, Frank appeared very nervous and would not allow him to remain in the factory, and so Lee left. He returned at 6 p.m., and when he did, he encountered James Gant. Gant was a former employee who had worked as a bookkeeper and had been caught stealing money from the cash drawer, and so he had been fired by Frank. Frank allowed him into the factory to recover two pairs of shoes. Frank returned home and was there by 6.25. At 7 p.m., he called the factory to ask Lee if the encounter with Gant had gone okay. Frank completely stripped down to show him his body that there were no scratches or cuts, and when the police investigated his home, they found that there was no blood on any of the laundry. Frank also hired Pinkerton detective Harry Scott to look into the murder, and he agreed that Scott should share all information with the police. But what he didn't know was that Harry Scott was good friends with John Black, who was a detective on the case. Black had determined from the very beginning that Frank was guilty, and he investigated with that idea in mind. Mary was buried in the Marietta City Cemetery. On Tuesday, April 29th, Detective Black searched Newt Lee's home, and at the bottom of a burn barrel, he found a shirt that was completely covered in blood. 
However, because he said that the shirt didn't have a smell, he felt that the shirt had been planted by Frank. Leo Frank was arrested at 11.30 that day, and it was believed that Newt Lee was his accomplice. On Wednesday, April 30th was the coroner's inquest. Several witnesses came forward to say that Leo Frank had been inappropriate with young women, that he had flirted with them, and in one case had even propositioned one of them. On Thursday, May 1st, Jim Conley, the factory's janitor, was arrested because he had been seen trying to wash what looked like blood out of a blue work shirt. He told the police that it was rust, and they gave him the shirt back. However, they kept him in jail. When a witness stated that they had seen a black man wearing a blue work shirt in the lobby of the factory around the time of the murder, the police began questioning him harder. The police discovered that Conley could read and write, and so they had him write several notes comparing his handwriting to that of what was supposed to be Mary's death letters. What they discovered was that there were remarkable similarities between the two. On May 21st, Connolly admitted to writing the letters, saying that Frank had ordered him to, but that he hadn't heard about the murder until Monday the 28th. He then changed his story, saying that Frank had invited him to the factory and hidden him all day long, but still ordered him to write the letters. The pencil company officials did not believe this to be the case. They believed that Connolly had come into the factory intending to steal from an employee and Mary was an easy victim especially because her purse was missing. Police tried to force a confrontation between Conley and Frank, but Frank refused because his attorney was out of town. Police took this as an admission of guilt. On May 24th, a grand jury indicted Leo Frank for the murder of Mary Fagan. On May 29th, Jim Conley, who had been in prison for 28 days by this point, gave another story. This time, he stated that Frank had confessed to him the entire thing. In fact, he had helped Frank carry the body down to the basement. He also said that Frank offered him $200 if he would help him get away with it. There were three newspapers at the time, and they competed for the most exploitative headlines. The Atlanta Constitution, the Atlanta Journal, and the Atlanta Georgian. The Georgian even published doctored photos of Fagan's autopsy and statements from several people who said that they had heard confessions from Leo Frank. The police also released a steady stream of information to the papers. On July 28, 1913, the trial of Leo Frank began. He had eight attorneys. The courtroom was packed and there were hundreds of people outside. Conley was the main witness against Frank and both sides, prosecution and defense, depicted him as racist as absolutely possible. Both sides leaned into that very heavily. The prosecution brought up a whole parade of witnesses stating that they knew that Frank had been bringing young women up to his office and abusing them. But the defense also brought up a stream of witnesses who stated exactly the opposite, that Frank had never been inappropriate and that he was of good character. Based on the witnesses of the defense, they were able to account for every moment of Frank's time from 11.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m. except for an 18-minute window between 12.02 p.m. and 12.20 p.m. According to Connolly and the prosecution, the murder would have taken at least half an hour to commit and cover up. It took over three weeks for all of the testimony to go through, but it took less than four hours for the jury to bring back a verdict. Judge Leonard S. Rowan was so concerned that there would be violence in the courtroom if Frank was acquitted that he ordered that Frank and his attorneys not be present at the time that the verdict was read. But on August 26th, Leo Frank was found guilty of the murder of Mary Fagan and he was sentenced to death. The prosecutor, Hugh Dorsey, was carried on the shoulders of his supporters out of the courthouse and then crowd surfed in the street as everyone cried and cheered in joy. In October 1913, the Anti-Defamation League was created shortly after Frank's conviction. On February 24th, 1914, Connolly was given a one-year sentence for being an accomplice in Mary Fagan's murder. The defense, of course, immediately appealed the case, saying that public opinion had heavily weighed on the jurors. They also brought in statements from several witnesses who had repudiated their testimony, and the state biologist had examined the hair found on the lathe and determined that it was not Mary Fagan's. The Georgia Supreme Court denied the appeal, and so it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, 
I very seriously doubt if the petitioner has had due process of law because of the trial taking place in the presence of a hostile demonstration and seemingly dangerous crowd thought by the presiding judge to be ready for violence unless a verdict of guilty was rendered. The United States Supreme Court also denied his appeal with only two judges dissenting, including Holmes. In April of 1915, an application for commutation of sentence was sent to the Georgia Board of Prisons, and it was denied by a vote of two to one. At that point, there was nothing left to do except submit the case to Governor John Slayton. The governor viewed the crime scene and over 10,000 pages of evidence and testimony. He also read several letters, including one from Judge Roan that he had written shortly before his death, asking the governor to please rectify his error. While Slayton worked on this commutation, he received over 1,000 death threats. Eventually, he released a 29-page document in which he upheld the juror's decision, stating that any reasonable person would come to the same conclusion, based on the testimony given. However, he questioned Conley's testimony and said that it did not match up with the evidence that they had. On June 21st, 1915, Governor Slayton commuted the sentence of Leo Frank to life in prison. He told reporters that he believed that, he, that Conley was guilty. In private, he told friends that he fully expected Leo Frank to be able to prove his innocence and therefore he did not issue a pardon. Slayton was hung in effigy and the National Guard had to be sent to his home to protect him and his wife. Luckily for him, his term ended just a few days later and he received a police escort to the train out of town and he and his wife did not return to Georgia for 10 years. Frank was moved to Milledgeville State Penitentiary before the commutation was announced in order to ensure his safety. However, Soon after he got there, inmate William Crean attacked him with a butcher knife, slicing his knife because he said he was sure he would get a pardon if he killed Leo Frank. Frank survived the attack. After the trial and during the appeal period, Tom Watson, the editor of the Jeffersonian, took a, a very hard stance attacking Leo Frank. For the next 18 months, he would inflame anti-Semitic prejudices all across the area. He portrayed Frank as a defiler of young women and also a Jewish capitalist who had come down to suck the money away from poor Georgia farmers. He printed articles about blood libel and pulled out every single anti-Semitic trope you can think of. And his readership jumped 350%. After the commutation was announced, Watson advocated for lynching. 28 men created the Vigilance Committee, also known as the Knights of Mary Fagan. Some members of the Vigilance Committee were Joseph Mackey Brown, a former governor of Georgia, Eugene Herbert Clay, future president of the Georgia Senate, and E.P. Dobbs, the mayor of Marietta. Several current and former sheriffs were also in the group. On August 16th, eight cars in the lynching party left Marietta from Milledgeville and arrived around 10 p.m. The electrician cut the telephone wires while other members of the party drained all the gas from the automobiles. They went in, handcuffed the warden, and removed Frank. The 175 mile drive to Frey's Gin took over seven hours at around 18 miles per hour. The committee had set up lookouts for them all along the route. The spot in Frey's Gin had been prepared by Sheriff William Frey with a table and a rope. When they arrived in Frey's Glen, Frank was placed on the table, a noose was put around his neck, and he took off his wedding ring asking that it be returned to his wife before the table was jerked out from under his feet and he died. Men, women, and children arrived and they cut pieces of his shirt into souvenirs to take home. Several photographs were taken and later turned into postcards and sold for 25 cents each at the local stores where they also sold more pieces of his shirt, branches from the tree, and pieces of the rope. His body was returned to Atlanta for burial, and thousands besieged the funeral parlor demanding to see the body, and when they were refused, they began throwing bricks. Eventually, the parlor allowed them in, and over 3,000 people walked past to see Leo Frank. Leo Frank was returned home to New York, where he was buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Glendale, Queens. A grand jury was seated to indict those who had been involved in the lynching. However, no charges were filed, and it's believed that some of the people who had actually been on the Vigilance Committee were also on the grand jury. It was an open secret as to the identities. Several of the same men who had been in the Vigilance Committee 
would meet several months later on Stone Mountain, Georgia, and create the modern-day Ku Klux Klan. Jim Connolly would spend the rest of his life in and out of prison, mostly for crimes of violence against women. Most historians now believe that this was a gross miscarriage of justice, that Jim Connolly was guilty of the murder of Mary Fagan, that Leo Frank was a victim of anti-Semitism. In 1982, Alonzo Mann, who had been Frank's office boy at the time, said that he had seen Jim Connolly carrying Mary Fagan's limp body towards the basement on the day of the murder. He said that Connolly had threatened to kill him if he ever told. And when Mann told his mother, his mother told him to just be quiet. In 1986, the state of Georgia issued a posthumous pardon to Leo Frank. They said that they did not know as to his guilt or innocence. However, the pardon was issued because they failed to protect him in order for him to pursue further appeals, and they also failed to arrest his murderers. A memorial to all of those who had been lynched in Georgia during this period was erected in 2018, a few feet away from where Leo Frank was lynched. If you decide to do any research into this case on your own, I recommend that you be very careful about your sources. Several of the most common websites that use both victims' names in this case are associated with the white supremacist movement. That was a rough one. I'm gonna take things a little lighter on Friday for Fun Friday. So, Hermes the Owl and I hope that you do attend.